this morning's message on missions is called a whole church strategy. So is the church sufficient for this? And who is the church? I think you know who the church is, correct? Uh, that would be every one of you that is a member, saved, baptized member of this church. So when we talk about is the church sufficient, we have to be thinking what is the church? Because does that mean your pastor or the staff are sufficient for the task or that the pastor and the staff and the workers, you know, we have this really strange thing that we've done in our church in the modern world is we've divided our church between the workers and the spectators. And there is actually no such thing as a church where everyone in the church is not a worker, by the way. It just, we're, 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 we're so far down from what God designed the church to be, we've made these funny divisions there. But I, I would like to pray. Father, I thank you again for this morning, and I thank you, Father, for that statement, the sufficiency of the church. And Lord, you have the best model for your work. And so may we not attempt to improve on it. May we just see what it is and then repent of the models and methods that we've devised. And we've not improved on anything, Lord, because we're a very busy generation, but we're not getting much done with our busyness. And so God, help us to really look back at biblical truth this morning and may your Holy Spirit um, guide us. May your Holy Spirit guide this church, this very special church, and uh, maybe open the eyes of uh, many within this body as to what their calling actually is. And Lord, would you please fulfill your promise in Ephesians when you said, now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And with that, may you then receive the glory in the church throughout all ages. Uh, bless this morning in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter number 8. The book of Acts, chapter number 8. And so we, we started off in Sunday school with this, um, the Great Commission mandate. Essentially, what we gather from that is that it is the will of God that the gospel gets preached to every creature which is under heaven, every nation, every creature, that is the will of God. It was mandated, it was demonstrated, and it was completed. We have all of that in the Bible. We have evidence. We see the command. We see the example. We see the completion of it. That now becomes our pattern. So now we want to look into the components of that. So again, if you don't believe that, then the rest of this would be boring to you probably. But, it, but if you actually kind of got hey, God actually expects us to reach the entire world and that that's a command. And if I don't do that, I'm out of the will of God. Uh, then we can go on and now look at this biblical format and strategy and pattern as to how it actually happens. So the, the message this morning now is missions is a whole church strategy. Now, typically when we think about missions, um, if you were to go to Bible college and sign up to be a missionary, you would probably have to take a class called Paul's Missionary Journeys. And that's going to be, that's going to be very funny, actually. We're going to talk about um, studying Paul's missionary journeys and then doing exactly the opposite. That's going to be this afternoon. Our missions model is the opposite of what Paul actually presented. So you won't want to miss um, tonight's message on that. Um, but we often overlook probably the, the first and greatest example of missions, which is multiplication of the gospel, and the fruit of the gospel is multiplication of churches. So we multiply the gospel, and then churches are multiplied. So let's look here in Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 1. And, as, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and the his death there is Stephen. So if you were to look in the previous chapter, um, you want to be a great deacon, um, follow the example of Stephen. He got ordained as one of the deacons, preached one sermon, and got stoned to death. That was it. Now, he wasn't stoning the pastor to death. He was getting stoned to death. Anyway, that was a joke. The only joke you'll get the whole week. Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. 
Um, and the reason that it's used singular, the church, which is at Jerusalem, is because on earth, at this particular time, that was the only church in Jerusalem. And up until Acts chapter number 8, all you'll hear about is the church. You won't hear about churches. You'll just hear about church because the first several chapters of Acts deal very specifically on what that church did within the city of Jerusalem. And we already heard in our last message uh, that it said that they had filled Jerusalem with the doctrine of Christ. So they had done. Uh, Acts 1.8 said, ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem then Judea and Samaria. So they had, they had fulfilled their responsibility in Jerusalem. And then he says, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. All right, so the words, um, by the way, words mean things, don't they? Yeah. Remember what I said in the last, sometimes when you read the Bible, just kind of slow down and chew on what you're reading. Did you notice who was scattered? Who was scattered in verse one? Yeah, it says, and they were all scattered. So who is the all there? What, what is that people? The church. And who was not scattered abroad? The apostles. All right, so the entire church. Now we, we need to look at how big is this church. We know that there was 120 in the upper room. We know that in Acts 2, 3,000 were saved, baptized, and added to the church. We know that a chapter later, there was a 5,000 that were saved, baptized, and added to the church. And then the Bible just says that there was multitudes. There was a great company of, the, of priests that were added to the faith. And then it will say that the number of the disciples was multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So you take 5,000, 3,000, that's 8,000, then multitudes, then multiplied greatly. How big was that church? You know, there's all kinds of, it's, it's guesstimates, because once they start going to multiplying, you just got to guess from there. But that church very well could have been 20, 25,000 um, people. So when it says they were all scattered, that means all 25,000 of them were scattered. Um, it was only the apostles who were not scattered. But what does that mean they were scattered? So the, the word scattered, um, again, just like the word power, um, there are a couple different meanings for scattered. For example, you don't have to turn there, but in John 16, 32, it says that all the disciples were scattered. And the word scattered there is the Greek word is scorpizo, which means to dissipate, to put to flight, uh, routed or terror stricken. So that scattered is kind of like, look, we just came from Fiji and it's tropical. And so there's cockroaches and in, in the dark night, cockroaches uh, are all having a good time until you turn the light on. And then what do cockroaches do when you turn the light on? They scatter. Uh, that's scorpizo. Uh, they're, they're terrified to get squashed. And so they know that they need to run. Um, there are times when people um, run for their life out of fear. If you were in a stadium and a bomb went off, what would happen in that stadium? They would scatter. Right? But the word scattered here in Acts 8 is not that word because it kind of sounds like there was this great persecution against the church that was at Jerusalem and now they're all kind of running for their life. But that doesn't fit the pattern that we've been seeing because when, Paul, when Peter and John were, were beaten and let go, it said they went back to their own company and they began to worship God and say, thank you that we are counted worthy to suffer for your name. It doesn't appear at all that they were fearful of persecution. Well, the word scattered here is a different word. It's the Greek word diaspiro or diaspiero, which means to sow throughout, to distribute in foreign lands. So it could be like scattering seed if you were a farmer. Right, and you're going through the field and you're scattering seed. It's, it's not a bomb exploding. The idea is you're logically putting your seed throughout the field. It also means to distribute in foreign lands, uh, a diaspora, if you will, a, a migration. But there was no fear here because notice what it says next. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women and committing them to prison. 
Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went, uh, went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. That's very interesting. It said they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. I wonder why they picked Judea and Samaria. Like, I mean, what, what came into their mind? Okay, we're, we're going to all go to Judea and Samaria and we're going to preach. D does that kind of sound like where they were told to go? Yeah. See, some people get the idea that, that they weren't being obedient to the Great Commission in Jerusalem, so God had to use the persecution to spread them. And I'm not quite sure that that's accurate. I think what happened when the persecution came, they were all willing to die. I, I don't think they were afraid of the persecution. But what was happening, Saul was going around to every house and he was hailing men and women and putting them into prison. Now, they had already done what they were required to do in Jerusalem. They had filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. So what do we do now? Do we stay here and let every one of us get taken to prison? Or what did that what were we told to do? Go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And they went everywhere preaching. So this is a church mission trip. The entire church is now going to thrust out of their city. And how many of the church are going on this mission journey? All of them. And guess who's not going? The ordained ones are not going. The apostles are staying behind in Jerusalem, and the entire church is going to be scattered abroad. It was an intentional scattering. And what was the result of this? Now, when you get to Acts chapter number 9, go to Acts chapter number 9. Acts 9 talks about the conversion of the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. <clears throat> Now, this, this, is, this is fantastic. Acts 9.31, it said, then had the, oh, that's the first time church is now found in the plural in the book of Acts. We had the church, the church, the church, the church, the church, and now all of a sudden it said, then had the churches rest throughout all where? Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were what's being multiplied. Churches are being multiplied. Now, when you read the first eight, seven chapters of the book of Acts, you'll see things like the number of the disciples was multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. But now we're finding that the number of churches is being multiplied. Now, I have another map I want to put up on the screen. This map is of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. So if you can throw that up on the screen. And I want to make a plug for your Bible maps again. You probably have a map that looks just like this in the back of your Bible. Can I encourage you to read the Bible and get, get your map out and watch? Because it's very beautiful. And I, I don't have a pointer thingy, so I'm going, to, I'm going to come look up here. So I just would like you to see that you've got provinces here. Down at the bottom, this is Judea. And there's the city of Jerusalem. North of Judea, you have Samaria, right? That's the area that they always tried to go around. Remember, because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And when Jesus was leaving Galilee to go to Judea, he said, I must pass through Samaria, right, for evangelism. Right, then you get up to Galilee, this region up here. Now, Galilee is where Jesus spent most of his ministry. If you were to take the three and a half year ministry of Christ, it's almost exclusively in this area he would come down to Jerusalem like a good Jew would do three times a year because there was a feast at Jerusalem that the law required Jewish males to appear. And so Jesus went three times a year. And there's different books of the, of the Gospels talk more about what he said while he was in Jerusalem. But he would go down, make him mad, they'd try and kill him, and he'd go back up to Galilee. Now, if you go north of Galilee, you're going to come to Syria. And then right up in the top right-hand corner, you have Damascus. Now you have Damascus. All important. I just, I want you to get the, the, the geography of that. So the gospel starts down at Jerusalem. And then in Acts 8, they are scattered throughout all Judea and Samaria. Now, this is what I believe the logic was. Jesus had already been all through Galilee, Samaria, Judea, a little bit in Decapolis, actually, was evangelized by who? The maniac of Gadara. The maniac of Gadara, when he, Jesus said, can I stay with you? He said, no, 
go back to your family and friends. And it said he published throughout all Decapolis. So when you get into all these areas, you got the Phoenician woman that Jesus met up in Tyre and Sidon, all up there. So Jesus, his 12 and the 70 had already been around all this region, sowing the seeds, the gospel of the kingdom. Christ is here. But now that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, the church at Jerusalem is now going to spread into those areas. And what's the doctrine that they're going to take? He's who he said he was, and he has risen from the dead. And the result of that is churches were planted. Now, it says that they were going to go to Judea and Samaria, but they actually went all the way up to Galilee. This is multiplication, and it's happening on the backs of ordinary church members. This is what I want you to get. This great church planting movement is happening on the backs of the ordinary church members. Now, in chapter number nine, the first part of it, Saul, who later becomes Paul, is on his way where? He's on his way to Damascus. So now, when you get the map, you see Damascus all the way up there on the north. Why in the world is he going to travel all the way to Damascus? Because he's got letters in his hands. And he's going to start at Damascus, and he's going to make his way back down south, and he's going to stop in synagogues and give them a copy of the letter that he has authority from the high priest that if he finds any of this way to bring them bound back into Jerusalem. Now, what was he doing in Jerusalem? He was going house to house and trying to find all the believers and putting them in prison. But what's, what's now happened in Jerusalem? Kaboom. They're now spreading. So why does he go all the way to Damascus? In, in my mind, if I could dig into Paul's mind, I think to him that was the northern wall. Okay, they're already spreading throughout all this area. So let me go right up to Damascus. I'm going to start there and work my way down. But what does he find when he gets to Damascus? Okay, on the road to Damascus, he meets Jesus. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Lord, what will thou have me to do? He says, go into the city and it'll be told you what to do. And who does he meet in Damascus, in Syria? He meets a disciple named Ananias who does what? Baptizes him. So who can baptize? You got to be a church to baptize. So what does that tell you was already in Damascus? There was already a church there. There were already disciples there. When Saul gets saved, he goes around in Damascus and he preaches and it stirs the Jews up. So the disciples have to let him down in a basket over the city. And then Saul travels all the way down to Jerusalem. He comes back. He left with letters to arrest Christians, but he got arrested by Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he comes all the way back down to Jerusalem. And they're like, whoa, what is he doing back here? All right. So we now have this explosion. We have this absolute explosion taking place. And um, we have churches now in Judea, in Samaria, in Galilee, in Syria. But does it actually stop there? No, because by Acts chapter number 11, news has come back to the elders of the church at Jerusalem that the gospel has gone as far as Antioch. Now, there's. Uh, Antioch is actually north of Damascus. Antioch is also in Syria. And by the time it gets all the way up into Antioch, the church at Jerusalem says, we should commission some leadership to this movement now. And so they ordain Barnabas, and they send Barnabas as far as Antioch. Barnabas gets up to Antioch, and when you read Acts chapter number 11, uh, Barnabas goes, what in the world? I mean, can you, can you imagine this? Okay, your, your pastor gets together and says, okay, everybody, we're all going to get killed if we stay here in Bakersfield. So what we're going to do, we're going to send every one of you, and we're going to divide up all the cities of California. Right? And then this church, as of today, you're all gone. Like, he's got no one to preach to next week because you're all gone. And it just keeps spreading and keeps spreading and keeps spreading. And Finally, someone from Seattle calls and says, hey, could you send some help up here? It's like, Seattle, what are you doing all the way up in Seattle? See, I, want, I really want you to think about this. The greatest, most amazing missions movement in the Bible is in Acts 8.1. Now, we come around later, and then Paul shows up. Paul is going to eventually, years later, Paul's going to join the church at Antioch. And there from that church at Antioch, we're going to begin the first, second, and third missionary journeys of Paul. But this, this is at least a dozen years later. But there's been great missionary activity happening. And I think one of the 
critical mistakes that we have made is that we have delegated missions and reaching to the world to a very, very, very small group of commissioned missionaries. There are today, the independent Baptist world, roughly, and it's hard because we're independent, so we can't, we don't have a central location to collect numbers, but it's been estimated that we have today around five and a half thousand missionaries. Five and a half thousand missionaries. That represents less than one half of one percent of our church's membership. Less than one half of one percent of our membership. Now, look what happened in Acts 8. How did that happen? How did we get so quickly from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, Syria, Damascus? How did that multiply so fast? It's because we didn't delegate the responsibility to a handful of ordained missionaries. Now, trust me, there's a, there's a place for what we call missionaries, like the, the role, and Paul's going to demonstrate that. Because you are going to get men who are separated to the work, who are going to go on these journeys. You're going to have Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Timothy and Titus and Tychicus and Erastus and uh, Aquila and Priscilla. You're going to get all kinds of people who get involved in this. But I appreciate the fact that the Bible began with an all church missions movement before we looked at delegating smaller numbers to travel to the entire world. Do you think God was trying to tell us something? So why can't we get the job done today? Because very few people within our Baptist churches ever engage in the Great Commission. Right? We, have a, we have a few people who do it, but most of the people do not, so we can't ever get the job done. Now, what is very interesting is when you begin to, and you know what, there, I have another uh, picture, if you guys can get it up, that's Paul's first missionary journey. I will go ahead and look at that this morning as well. Something else that I began to look at is this rare? Like, what happened with the church at Jerusalem when, um, okay, so everybody in this church got involved? Is that normal? Like, is, is that a normal pattern within churches? And how long do you wait before you get involved? Like, if you got, if you got saved this week, right, you got, if you got saved this week and then you got baptized, you got added to the church, like, what's the time frame between your salvation and your conversion and getting to the rest of the world? Let's look at a few verses. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 16. This map, by the way, um, this is um, what would be called uh, Paul and the team's first missionary journey. Um, and we're going to look at this again tonight. But, of course, you've got Antioch up there in the corner where it begins. Um, and then you can see it goes down to Cyprus, goes up to all those places. Actually, what I wanted is the second missionary journey, but I don't have a picture of that. But that's okay. We're going to talk about this tonight, the, the idea of journeys. But Philippians chapter 4, verse number 16. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 16. Uh, and remember the church at Philippi. Can you remember the story of its founding? Right, It was on the second missionary journey. They, Paul had revisited the churches. They go all the way to Troas. Paul gets a, a vision in the night to come over into Macedonia and help us. That's the Macedonian call. He picks up Luke there. And so Paul and uh, Silas and Luke and Timothy, they're the team at that point. They then go across into Macedonia. And the first city they go to is Philippi. All right? And they find Lydia down by the riverside and women having prayer. They join the prayer meeting. Lydia gets saved. Her household gets saved. They get baptized. Her house now becomes the hub for the church there in Philippi. Uh, they're going down, and there's this demon-possessed woman that keeps following them all the time. And Paul turns around and casts the demon out of the lady. She's happy, but everybody in the city's mad because she used to use some kind of fortune-telling to help the men of the city get rich in their business. So they're all upset. They bring Paul and Silas to the magistrates. They get beaten. They get put in jail. Remember that? Then they have the singing and praying at midnight. You have the earthquake. The Philippian jailer gets saved and gets baptized. And the next day, they tell him to leave the city. When you follow Paul's missionary journeys, you will find that he doesn't get to stay very long in any one city. 
Philippi, we don't know how long, but it was probably only a couple of months, maybe three months, maybe six months tops. Now, if, if you're a missionary and you're thinking of going into a city and you're going to plant a church, uh, do you think you're thinking three, three months, thinking six months? No, I can, I can tell you, as a, a missionary who practiced our Baptist model, you, you in no circumstances think about leaving a city after three months. I mean, uh, we, we call a term four years. And the idea is that maybe at four years, but a lot of times a missionary has been four years at one church and then he goes on furlough and he comes back to that one church again for like a second term. It's usually two terms before a missionary feels comfortable leaving that church with, with anybody. Three months? Six months? So Paul leaves that church and when he leaves Philippi, he goes down to Thessalonica. And when he gets to Thessalonica, he's not even there very long. He goes three Sabbath days into the synagogue, and then after three Sabbath days, there's another uproar in the place. He might have been in Thessalonica even less than that. But notice what he says to the Philippians here. In Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 15. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... No church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Okay, think. How old is the church at Philippi when he leaves to go to Thessalonica? It's, it's a baby church. Yet Paul said, when I went over into Thessalonica, he said, you at Philippi sent once and again, unto my necessity. <clears throat> How did they send? You think they sent a money gram or Western Union or what they do? You understand, <clears throat> in the short time that Paul was at Philippi, he had already convinced them that they at Philippi were responsible for getting the mission, the gospel to the world. And when Paul left to go to the next town, Thessalonica, this church sent two different delegations on mission trips to supply the needs of the mission team in Thessalonica. Two, two, two journeys of a baby church. Now look at Thessal uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul spent very little time here. First Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse number 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. In what? In power and in the Holy Ghost. Remember I told you earlier, I think in Sunday school, uh, or maybe this morning, that it will take the power of God. Right? It, the miracles still happen. We often think about miracles in the sense of, okay, blind eyes were opened or somebody was healed. But I'm not talking about those miracles uh, of, of healing. I'm saying in, in, order for, in order for things to happen, God has to miraculously intervene in, in what we're, we're doing. And Paul will say this to the Corinthians. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And he says it again here. Our gospel came unto you not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were, what? And samples to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every, now listen carefully, in every place, your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Now, let's just pause for a minute. When Paul writes to the Thessalonian church, he said that from them, the word of the Lord had sounded out in every place. And then he mentions Macedonia and Achaia. So you understand if you, if you don't ever look at your maps, you're like, oh, that's meaningless to me. So let me, let me draw a mental picture for you because I don't have the map of this one. Leave Philippi and you go over into Thessalonica. 
Can you imagine this? This is now the map in your mind over Thessalonica. After Thessalonica, this church has started. Paul's there for three weeks to three months. He travels down to Berea. And then after Berea, he travels south and he ends all the way over in Athens. Now, when Paul gets to Athens, he's deeply concerned about the church at Thessalonica. When you read the letter to the Thessalonians, he'll explain this in the letter. He said, I, I knew the tribulation and the affliction, and I was, I was fearful that the amount of persecution you were under might have quenched your fervor for Christ and the gospel. So he said, at Athens, I was content to be left alone, and I sent Timothy to go back up and check on you. So down at Athens, Timothy is now given his first solo journey. He goes back up to Thessalonica. Paul, in the meanwhile, goes over and passes through Achaia, a province, and he ends up in Corinth. When he's at Corinth, Timothy comes and rejoins him there and gives him the good news. He says, everything in Thessalonica is going okay. They have not lost their faith. They are still faithful. They're preaching the gospel. And so Paul then writes the letter to the Thessalonians at Corinth, puts it in the hand of Timothy, and Timothy delivers it back up to Thessalonica. And Paul says, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, even in Achaia. Now, Paul left Thessalonica, went to Berea, came down to Athens, and passed Achaia to get into Corinth. And what did he find out when he got to Achaia? The gospel was already in Achaia at the hands of who? The Thessalonian church? Now, Paul hadn't been gone from Thessalonica. In fact, he was going south already. And by the time he zips across, the gospel's already in Achaia. And I don't know what that was. Up in Thessalonica, were, were, there, were there people in that church involved in business and commerce and whatever it might be? And within just a couple of months of their conversion, they're already down in Achaia. And what are they doing? They are preaching the gospel. And Paul said from this baby church, that they were already having the gospel sounding out throughout the whole world. Look at Romans chapter number one. <clears throat> Romans chapter number one, verse seven, to all that be in Rome, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout where? The whole world. So, so my question is, which church was it that was getting the gospel to the whole world? Was it the church at Jerusalem that was getting the gospel to the whole world? Was it the church at Antioch that was going to all the world? Or was it the church at Rome that was getting to all the world? Or was it the church at Thessalonica that their faith was being sounded out through the whole world? Like, like which church is heading this thing up? Each one of them was heading it up. Each church that was established was given marching orders, this great commission, and as soon as they were evangelized and as soon as they had received the gospel, they were immediately equipped and separated to take the gospel to the whole world. And now you might be thinking, oh, no, it, it takes a long time. Oh, let, let me tell you, we have chosen a slow as molasses model. The, the model that we have as independent Baptists, it, 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 I mean, it is like frozen molasses to get things moving. I was saved in August of 1992 at uh, 16, just short of 17 years old. And three years later, I was on a mission trip. I was a first semester Bible college student at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College that used to be in San Dimas, California. Uh, our team, we took a summer mission trip to Fiji, and uh, I essentially stayed for 23 years on that missions trip. I, I mean, I came back, I packed my bags, my church sent me. When my, when my church commissioned me to go to Fiji, I'd returned. I'd just turned 20. I had a semester of Bible college, uh, no support, no wife, you know. Um, 
And, and I went, and you know what? You know what everybody told me? Not everybody, but you know what 99% of people told me? You're not ready. 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 Let me ask you. I wonder how ready the church at Philippi was for that. I wonder how ready the church at Thessalonica was at that. I wonder how ready the church at Rome, because this is the thing you're going to find. You're going to find that if being ready to do the mission were to take as many years as we said it takes you to get the mission done, nothing in the book of Acts would have happened. How, how in the world is this, is this happening? Well, I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. If I were to ask you this question, uh, if you could define for me the characteristics of a faithful man or a faithful woman, what would that be? Uh, often we, we, we have church. Okay, we're here this morning, and we're going to be back here tonight, and then we're going to be here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night for the conference, and we might define faithful as all the people who will be here, like that you show up and that you're here, and I would hope that you could find it in your very, very busy schedules to be here for something as important that we're talking about, like, how do we get the gospel to the whole world? Like, to me, that would be important enough um, to whatever else is on your agenda. You could, you could just slip a little bit of time in for God. But, but our standard of faithfulness is so low, we define it people who show up. That's faithful. Or, or maybe you read your Bible every day. And you, you understand that in our generation, th this is even a struggle, like just to open your Bible and read it every day. Like, 24 hours in a day, taking 15 minutes to sit down and open your Bible and read it. That's like, that's like climbing Mount Everest to the average Christian. You know, how just, did you read your Bible today? Ah, I didn't have time. And I'm like, oh, I would love to see your screen time. Like, I would love to get the report from your phone of your screen time when you say you don't have time to read the Bible or to pray, right? Many people have been saved for many years and they can't even hit the low-level standard of faithfulness, which is just read your Bible and pray every day and come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, give your tithes, give your, your... Like, to us, that's a definition of faithfulness. But that is not God's definition of faithfulness. It is not his definition of faithfulness. 2 Timothy 2, in verse number 2, he says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... Okay, I do like that word, witnesses. And ye shall be witnesses to me. You understand who God determined to be witnesses? Was, was every believer. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That is the definition of faithfulness. Faithfulness is that that which has been delivered to you, you can turn around and deliver it to somebody else. We have become stewards of the mysteries of Christ. So stewardship means we have this responsibility that the truth that has been delivered to us, we turn around and deliver it to somebody else. Faithfulness is the idea that I can transmit what I have learned to someone else. Now, now, listen, if, if you begin to judge your faithfulness based on this, you may not feel so good about yourself. I think about people who have sat in church for, let's say, three years. Saved, baptized, added to the church for three years. And at three years, if the pastor walked up to one of the men and said, hey, I'm going to be gone next Sunday, I'd like you to preach. Most men would be like, uh, 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 uh. I, 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 what, did you learn anything these last three years? Like, what did you learn? Stand up and preach it. You, you understand that the office of the bishop, the pastor, is a distinct office, and, and one of those qualifications is that we are apt to teach, that we have an aptitude to teach. It's, it's part of the calling. But the Bible also defines a faithful man as someone who can teach others also. Um, I've asked several of my friends who are military, military guys, whatever branch of the military, and I said, is there any expectation that you have to teach other people what you've learned? They're like, well, that's how the military works. Okay, you come in as a bonehead into boot camp, and they don't care what you've learned. They're going to scratch everything you've learned. They're going to empty your brain, and they're going to start all over with you. 
And then you graduate from boot camp, then you're going to go to your tech school, whatever it is, to learn your particular skill. And as you advance up the ranks, what do you now have the responsibility to do to those that are below you? You're going to teach them. And I said, is there, is there any such position in our military as people who do nothing? Well, any of you been in the military in this room? Is there such position in the military as people who do nothing? No, everybody works. Everybody has a responsibility. Likewise, within the church, it was never God's plan that the Great Commission would be accomplished by our pastors, evangelists, missionaries, whatever they are. Pastors, evangelists, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, uh, the five offices that, that were listed there, all of them, if you read Ephesians, were there for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. God's plan has always been that every member does the work of the ministry and leadership is there to help perfect the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry. But some are, see, Baptists never, Baptists historically never believed in clergy laity. You understand what I mean by clergy laity? Like the laity is the people who pay the clergy to do the work of God. Like we're here to pay you to do the work of God because I promise you, Right now, as you sit here in this seat, okay, I, I've been a missionary, I've been a pastor, and I'm back to, like, I don't know what I call myself now, missionary, evangelist, whatever, but to, to take the gospel to the world, and, and people will look at me and say, yes, you're called to do that. Um, can we give you some money to help you do that? Well, and the answer to that would be, sure, we could use help on plane tickets and getting around the world, but don't, don't think for a moment, don't think for a moment that the fact that you wrote a, a check to help those who are getting around. Somehow, you, you are now absolved of any personal responsibility for those lost people in Sierra Leone or in North Korea or, or the Uyghur people in Northern China. You're not absolved. That's not somebody else's job. You have to teach others also. There is a group of people to whom God has designed you to teach them. You say, but I'm not called to be a pastor. Well, good. That means you don't have to lead a church. You, you don't have to oversee the particular congregation. But the, the way I look at it today, if, if you think the way we look at ministry, we've got pastors and missionaries, right? We kind of have this, uh, this class of people up there. The way I might liken it could be in the military to officers. Hey, you have to have officers, in the military, don't we? Because we've got to have some kind of structure, accountability, strategy, and all that. But how, how well do you think we would do is if America got sent to war and we left all the troops at home and we just sent the officers? What do you think would get done? Just about as much as getting done with our mission work today. We're leaving basically the world um, unreached. Now, what would change? What would change if, if I just picked one of you men here and I said, um, your pastor's going to be gone for six weeks. And you're going to preach the next six weeks while your pastor's gone. Okay. Would anything change? If I, if I came to one of you men and I said, you're going to be preaching for the next six weeks while your pastor's gone. Is there anything that would change in your study habits? Would you read the Bible any differently? Would you come to church any differently? Okay. When you... Um, when you go to college, if, let's say you went down to Bible college. Why does somebody go to Bible college? What would be the reasoning? Oh, I'm going to go into the ministry. So I have to learn the Bible, right? So when, when they jump into Bible college, because they think I have to do the work of the ministry, what do they show up to class with when they, when they show up to class? What would be with them? They have a Bible? What else would they have? They'd have a notepad? they have a pen. Why? Because they, they want to remember. Now, most of them only want to remember because they got to pass a test, right? But, but if their motive was right, they're like, well, I'm going to go into the ministry. I need to know these things. And you know how you get to know things? Like you have to study. You have to memorize. You have to write it. You have to take tests. Man, I am thinking we ought to change the way we do church. We should get rid of all the chairs and get like tables, books and no books and chewing gum so you don't fall asleep, Right? cup of coffee so you don't fall asleep? I mean, what if the reason we came to church was like, we're all getting thrust into the ministry and we have to learn everything we can learn so that we can each do the work of the ministry? Like, would that change why you came? Like, why do you come to church? You ever think about that? 
Like, what's what's the reason? I'll tell you, most people's reason for coming to church is, is, is a very self-centered reason. I'm going to face things this week, and when I go to church, I hear something that prepares me to face what I'm going to face this week. Like, we, we feel like we're getting, we're getting tools so that we can survive our week. Uh, like, we've got some kind of personal goals and personal agendas, and what can I learn from the Bible that will better my life? I've got an addiction. How do I get over my addiction? My marriage is falling apart. How do I get my marriage fixed? I'm struggling with depression. How do I get over my depression? I want to advance in my career. What are the biblical principles of finance that I can apply? If you were to look at it, most people look at coming to church very, very self-absorbed. What, what is in this to me? But what if you looked at it entirely differently? What if every member in the church said, I am personally responsible for getting the gospel to the entire world, and I have a role to play. I don't know exactly what my role is to play in that, but I have a significant role to play. My pastor has a responsibility. Like his responsibility is oversight in the local church. His responsibility is equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. But I'll tell you, one of the great frustrations of many pastors is that we never get out of the ABCs of Christianity. Like we're always preaching the basics. We're always still preaching about kind of petty little things going on in people's lives. It's, it's not like we're equipping an army. Like we're struggling to get people just to come, like just, just to show up. Like, like people want a participation trophy. I came to church. Do I get an award? I came 52 weeks out of this year. Like, you don't know, a word for attendance award for coming. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing at some point in somebody's life, but an all church strategy. So here's where we are. Um, I decided uh, when I pastored for the last five years, what could we do as a local church? What, what could we do as a church? Let, let's assume right now that there was nobody else in the whole world but our church could we actually engage the world with the gospel? And so for the last three years, our church in Wenatchee did 13 different missions journeys as a church. And we took about, our church is small, about 80, 90 people. Uh, and we probably took around 30 of the 90 on these different missions journeys. We did seven different trips to Zambia in Africa. We had two teams that went into Sierra Leone. We had one trip into Chennai, India, made one up into remote Alaskan tribes, did one into Guadalajara, Mexico. We've just finished a second trip into Fiji, and we did one to uh, polygamous Mormon villages in Utah. We took a group from our church to Beyond Borders Missions Camp so that we could get training on how to do off-grid remote missions. It, the, the idea was we're all supposed to do this. We're all supposed to do this together. We all have a role to play in this. And I, I think um, if we don't change this mentality, if church is more like a user-friendly type thing where I go, it, it, that, that I'm getting the psychological help that I need, I'm getting the motivation and the encouragement, and I agree your, your psychology needs help. And you might need motiv motivation. And your family might be falling apart. But I'll tell you the greatest motive for getting your family fixed is because it is the family that does the work of God together. Our family has a vision and a mission. Our family vision is this, a unified family for the cause of Christ. Our family mission is this, our family will work to build strong and loving relationships that will support and encourage one another as we give our lives for the cause of Christ. Like that's what I've trained my family. Like I've trained my family, we exist for the gospel. There's no sacred and secular, it's all about Christ. Everything we do, our whole existence on this earth is to get the gospel to the world, right? And if every family within the church realized that we are raising workers, do you know what God said about your children? It said they are arrows in the hands of a mighty man. And our children were meant to speak with the enemies in the gate, which is what the whole great commission is. But we cannot succeed at the Great Commission, as long as any of you sitting here think that this Great Commission belongs to somebody else. I'm going to tell you something else, and this, this will go back to our Camp Forge um, camp. My view is that young men and young women in our churches are bored to death. Because what's, what's, why do you go to church? Oh, we, we go to church, we learn how to be respectful, we learn how to be obedient to our parents, we learn how to submit our lives to God, we learn how to 
be not conformed to this world. We learn how to get bitterness out of our heart. We learn how to do this and that. But like for what? Like for, like for what? When we go on these mission trips, I, I, take our, I take our young kids, like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22. And you know what we do? We plant churches with them. Like, like we preach the gospel, we disciple people, and we establish churches with them. Uh, state of California, this, this great conservative state of California. Let me tell you this. In your state, the Mormons have 60,000 high school students in, in, in their high schools that are enrolled in their seminaries. And so these high school kids will go one hour or an hour early to school every day of the week to go to seminary for three years. And when they graduate from high school, what do you think they expect all those 60,000 kids to do? They'll give two years to missions. And you know what? They will. We as Baptists have five and a half thousand. That, that's all of us collectively together in the United States of America. And the Mormons from California are going to pump out 60,000 young people in the next three years around the world. And they're, because you know what? They have an expectation that missions is a whole church strategy. You understand? So if you're a member of this church right now, and you're thinking, what is our church going to do? Like, what is our church going to do to reach the world? And that's what you've got to do. You've got to look at this as if it's just our church. And thank God it's not. It's not just your church. Like, there's many more involved, and that's what's actually really cool, because we then get to collaborate. We get to work together. You're like, we get to join forces in this thing that we're doing. But you, you, we've rested on that for too long. Like for too long, we've been able to sit back and think, you know, there's a missionary over there and there's a missionary over there and there's a missionary over there. Do you, you know how funny it is to say, hey, praise God, the gospel is in, you know, Timbuk3 because we sent a missionary there. That, that's kind of like saying, hey, Amer like if America was a non-Christian country, the gospel needed, oh, it is a non-Christian country. Um, but if America was like an unreached country and somebody said, we sent a missionary to America. How many, how many missionaries would we need in America to, like, reach this place? I mean, America is a desperate place, so an all-church strategy. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do as a member of this church today. Would you, as a member of this church, be honest before God and, like, say, you know, Lord, I'm one of those people. Like, I'm, I'm faithful to my church. And, and I, I might be here and very supportive of it. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not rebuking you for that. But I'm saying, have, have you maybe had a little bit too low of a standard of what it would mean to be a faithful member of this church? Could you be thrust into any form of ministry today? Would you be ready to teach what you've been taught also? Or are you, are you guilty of being a hearer? Or are you even guilty of you've heard, but you, you wouldn't be able to? Like, maybe you've not paid enough attention to learn it well enough to teach others also. Because, you know, we listen differently. when we, what, If we're just listening for personal information, um, for example, I have no intention to be a mechanic. And so if we sat here today and somebody got up and I'm sitting in a mechanics class and they're talking about all the details of what to do with engines, I am not my son will do that. No, I'm not going to do that. You listen differently when you have intention of utilizing the information that you're learning. And too many of us have come to church with no intention of utilizing it. We kind of look at the information, well, that didn't really speak to me. That didn't really speak to me. Like we come to church with, I want God to speak to me. I want God. Well, what if God was going to teach you to be prepared for what somebody else would need? Like, like you, you don't have to have cancer to be a doctor to learn about cancer to go save somebody who has cancer. Right. Like, what if you saw that way? What if, you be, what if you realized that God expected you to be proficient with every bit of information that came across this pulpit? What if God held you personally accountable from what you've heard and that God had an expectation that you would use the information? And so you kind of wonder, why isn't God sending more people out? Because we're not equipped to be sent out. I promise you that if, if everyone in this church said, well, I guess we're all going to be missionaries. I guess we're all going to take the gospel to the world. And you started bringing your notebook to church and you started reading your Bible differently, had your devotions differently, and it was all with intention to be able to teach others also, I wonder if God would actually give you some more information. 
You know, he doesn't give his pearls to swine. He doesn't give that which is holy to the dogs. He doesn't give people ears to hear who it's going to be useless for them to hear it because they're not actually going to put it to use. You understand, we could, you understand that this church right here could change the world? This, this church right here has enough within this body right here that if you just believed this, that we as a church body are going to do this. And of, of course, there's more components to that, which is exciting because we, we get tonight and we look at missions as journeys and, and there, there's a way that you can get involved. There's a powerful way that you can get involved with this and we can show you all through the Bible how different people got involved with it but it's a whole church strategy.